Hello, and welcome to a study of the Bible, and thanks for your interest in spiritual matters. The most important decision that you will make in life is in regard to your soul's salvation. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, a Philippian jailer asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Although we live almost 2,000 years later, this remains the greatest and most important question someone could ever ask, and such an important question deserves a Bible answer. On this CD, you will listen to several capable gospel preachers direct your attention to the Bible's answer to this question. Because of the seriousness of the question and the importance of the answer, we invite you to get a Bible and follow along as these men give book, chapter, and verse as they endeavor to point you to the cross by explaining God's plan of salvation. The following seven studies provide an examination of each vital step one must take in the plan of salvation. Refer to the back cover of the carrying case of this CD to see the title of each particular study as well as the name of the preacher presenting the study. If you're using your computer to listen to this, please take advantage of the reference material contained on this CD by accessing the various text files. Also, 
we want to encourage you to write down any questions or comments you may have as you listen. You may refer to the address located on the back cover of the carrying case for this CD to contact us, and we'll be happy to discuss the Bible with you. At this time, we invite your attention to our first speaker. We welcome you to a study of the Bible word here in relationship to salvation. The word here in its various form appears many, many times throughout the Bible. The usage of the word covers a broad spectrum of meaning from simply the sensation of hearing to expressing the meaning of the message as being understood or perceived. It conveys the idea of one listening for the purpose of obedience. The Bible even speaks of God's hearing prayers indicating the fact that he responds to them. A few verses to illustrate this before getting to the main focus of our thoughts on hearing and conversion are in order. The sense of hearing or sensation of simply perceived sound is found in Matthew 11, verse 15. He that have ears to hear, let him hear. Mark 4, 23, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. The emphasis is simply the sense of hearing. Also, the word hear sometimes is distinguishing between simply hearing a sound and understanding it. In Acts 9 and 7 and Acts 22 and 9, Describing the events on the road to Damascus when Saul was going to persecute the church, it says in Acts 9 and 7, hearing a voice. But in Acts 22 and 9, it says, heard not the voice of him that spake to me. One simply emphasizes the fact they heard the sound, but the other points out they did not understand the purpose or the message given. The word hearken often emphasizes the idea of obedience to the spoken word or message. In Acts 4 and 19, Peter and John, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. The term is a plea to listen. James in Acts 15 and 13, men and brethren, hearken unto me. The term is sometimes translated give audience, Acts 13 and 16. The focus of our thoughts, though, as we said, is not simply to do a word study of the word here and its various forms. Rather, we want to look at the word here in relationship to salvation. There's nothing more critical to each of us than salvation. The Bible study of conversion, or what must I do to be saved, calls for all and for each to examine the Bible cases of conversion and the statements about conversion to discover what are the most common variables in being saved. Being saved from our sins. We can say without fear of contradiction that the most common primary action in conversion of the sinner is hearing the word spoken, the word preached, or the word taught. One must hear the gospel message. In Acts 2 and 22, on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. In Acts 8 and 12 at Samaria, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God. In the same chapter, Philip and the eunuch, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The famed case of Cornelius, the taking of the gospel to the Gentiles, in Acts chapter 10, we see in vision he was said, Send to Joppa, for one named Peter. He dwells at the house of Simon. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Continuing this line of thinking in Acts 10 and 32, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. In Acts 10, 33, we see the atmosphere was set. Therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded 
the of God. It actually only takes a casual reading to see hearing the gospel preached, the word of God declared is the ever primary and common variable to the process of conversion. Let us ask ourselves, though, a question. What is one of the most common errors in studying Bible conversions that is committed by people today? They typically take the uncommon features of the conversion cases rather than the common features. For example, visions are uncommon to all conversions, but careless reading we see by careless use, some overlook the common feature of hearing the word of God. Saul learned where to go by vision, but not what to do to be saved except by hearing the words brought by Ananias. Cornelius learned by vision who to contact and where to find that individual, but the man that was brought to them was brought to them so they could hear words whereby they and their house could be saved. Why such emphasis on hearing? The Bible says in Romans 10 and 17, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know more is being said in that passage, but it is evident that faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is little wonder in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, where it speaks of the breath of the people of Thessalonica, which ye heard literally is the word of hearing. The hearing of the word does not always produce faith, Hebrews 4 and 2. But if the faith of salvation is going to be produced, the word of God must be heard. We're not surprised by such. We recall the words of John chapter 6 verses 44 and 45. Jesus himself is the spokesman on this particular occasion. And it reads in this fashion as he talks about being drawn. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that have heard and have learned of the Father cometh unto me. Hearing is fundamental to conversion, and is proven by the constant testimony in conversion. Men heard the word. Fundamental to salvation today is not vision, not a miracle to undo a corrupt nature, not a mystical touch of the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke 8 and 15. We see it involves hearing the word in a good and honest heart. We see the receptive attitude of Acts 17 and 11. And we see the role of the word in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23. A received word, heard, believed, and obeyed. Yes, the word of truth to be carried out in our life. It is little wonder that Peter said to the unconverted, hear these words. And it's little wonder that John said to the converted, he that have ears, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In John chapter 3, verse 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This passage introduces us to the subject of belief and faith, without which we cannot be saved. In order to be successful at any endeavor in life, you have to believe in what you're doing. If you don't sincerely, wholeheartedly believe in what you're doing, you will not stick with it for the rest of your life. To illustrate what I'm talking about, I want to use a personal example. When I was in college, I needed some extra money, and I was convinced by a friend to sign up and sell some merchandise for a certain company. I became a soap salesman. But I was never convinced that the soap I was selling was worth the price I was charging. In fact, every time someone bought some of my soap, I felt they were getting ripped off. I felt they could have gone to the store and bought soap that was just as good for just a fraction of the price. Now let me ask you some questions and see if you can answer these questions based on the confession I've just made to you. Number one, how good of a salesman do you think I became for that soap company? 
Number two, do you think I stayed with that company for the rest of my life? And number three, do you think I would be willing to die for that soap company? Well, the truth of the matter is, I was a horrible salesman. I didn't stay with the company for very long at all, and I certainly wouldn't die for that company nor for their soap. Why? Because I didn't really believe that that soap or company was the best that there was. I wasn't convinced that this was really that great of a product. To be successful at anything, you have to believe in the product you're selling. People who are truly convinced use the product themselves. They constantly talk to their friends and neighbors about the product because they're truly convinced that this is the best there is on the market. People who truly believe in a product would never switch or try anything different. They're loyal and would never entertain the idea of something beating their product. Now, God knows this. God wants people to come to heaven and live with him, but he wants people who believe in the product, so to speak. He wants people who are so committed to the word and to the Lord that they use the product themselves. He wants people who constantly talk to their friends and neighbors about the Lord and his teachings. God wants people who are loyal and would never dream of trying anything different because they're convinced that what he offers is better than anything anyone else could possibly offer. God doesn't want people surrounding him in heaven who have divided hearts, people who might not be loyal, people who would turn on him the first opportunity they get. He wants people who have proven themselves trustworthy and loyal. The only way this can possibly happen is if a person comes to truly believe in the product that God offers. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. God the Father is offering to mankind a product, his only begotten Son. His Son is Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's only begotten Son by inheritance, Hebrews chapter 1. He's better than all of the prophets and all of the angels, Hebrews chapter 1. He's better than Moses, Hebrews chapter 3. He's better than Joshua, Hebrews chapter 4. He's better than Aaron, the high priest of Israel, Hebrews chapter 5. His New Testament is better than the Old Testament, Hebrews 8. His sacrifice of his own body is better than all of the sacrifices of all the Old Testament, Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. His church is better than the Jewish system, Hebrews 12. When men come to believe these things about Jesus, they are never the same again. When men are truly convinced that Jesus is God's Son, number one, they will obey every last syllable that he spoke. They will do what he said, even if it sounds ridiculous, even if it seems that no good will come from it. In Luke chapter 5, verse 5, But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. What drove Simon to obey the Lord here? Why would he throw the net into the water when it seemed such a waste of time? Because he truly believed in the Lord. Number two, men who are truly convinced that Jesus is God's son will have no question of loyalty. Men who truly believe in Jesus will stay with him even when everyone else is leaving. In John 6, verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. What made Peter and the other apostles so loyal? Why didn't they leave when everyone else was leaving? Because they had faith in the Lord. They were truly convinced that he was the Son of God. Number three, when men are truly convinced that Jesus is God's Son, they're willing to die for Him. The Lord becomes more important than life itself. In Revelation 12 and verse 11, they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto the death. How could people die for the Lord? How could they accept torture, imprisonment, loss of property, and death, all for the sake of the Lord Jesus? Because they believed with all their hearts that He was the Son of the living God. When men are truly convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, all the commandments in all of the scriptures become easy to perform. 1 John 5 verse 3. Because they're convinced in their heart of hearts that they're following after the Creator of life. But when men are not truly convinced, then every command is a burden. When men are not truly convinced Jesus is the Son of God, they question whether or not certain commands have to be obeyed. They bring no one else to the Lord. They attend the services of the church only when it's convenient. They quit the Lord's church at the first insult or injustice. They're untrustworthy and disloyal. You can never count on them. Now, in order that there might be a foundation upon which to base faith, 
God has given evidence. Never has God asked for blind faith. Blind faith is unbiblical. The Lord wants us to have a solid, unmovable, firm, unshakable faith. And that can only come from evidence that is solid and beyond any reasonable doubt. In John 20, verse 30, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Please notice, number one, Jesus worked signs in the presence of his disciples in order that there might be a basis for faith. Evidence, you see. Number two, signs were written down so that future generations could read and thereby believe in the deity of Jesus. Always, biblical faith is based on evidence. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. These are some of the most revealing passages in all of the Bible. They demonstrate the very purpose for the scriptures themselves. Why do we have a Bible at all? Why did God go to the trouble of inspiring the scriptures? Why have prophets and apostles die so that the world could have the scriptures? Because faith is based upon the evidence collected in those scriptures. And true faith is the only way that men will ever have their hearts fully devoted to the Lord. The Apostle Paul summed it up well when he wrote these words in Romans 6 verse 17. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Men obey from the heart only when they truly believe. This is the only way that they can put their hearts into what they're doing. In Acts 26, verse 19, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Repentance is the Bible way of saying change. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. If someone says, I repent, but they keep on sinning, well, they really haven't changed their mind. When people are doing things that are wrong, they must repent. Repentance is not just being sorry for past sins, although it includes sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, listen, godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. This passage shows that sorrow produces repentance, but is not repentance. When repentance has truly occurred, there is going to be a corresponding change in lifestyle. In Matthew 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 8, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Repentance then is a change of mind resulting in a change of living. We're talking about a change in habits. A habit is a way of living, a manner of life. God created us with the marvelous capacity to have what we call habits. This is when we do something for so long, it becomes part of us. Second nature is the expression we use to describe habits. Habits are hard to change for two reasons. First, we have grown comfortable doing them. We don't feel awkward or wooden while doing them. Second, habits have become an unconscious response. We don't have to think about it. We do them automatically. And that's why we use the expression second nature to describe habits. Habits are a great blessing. If God had not given us this ability, we would have to think consciously about everything that we do. I want to illustrate this by describing what happened when I learned how to drive a car. I began learning how to drive with a car that had a uh, standard transmission. I had to remember what the three pedals on the floorboard were for. I had to remember to press in the clutch before shifting the gears. I had to remember to use my turn signals and don't shift before the engine reaches 3,000 RPMs. Watch the rear view mirror. Watch the side view mirrors. Watch for the blind spot. Watch for traffic signs. Watch the speedometer. Watch the fuel gauge. And all of this was overwhelming. When I first began driving, I was very stiff and wooden. I was slow and unsure of myself. Every action was conscious and unnatural. 
but driving has become a habit now. Now I can drive, turn on the radio, have a conversation all at the same time, and I'm not worried in the slightest that I'm going to miss fourth gear. How does driving or anything become second nature like this? How does it become a habit? By practice. Disciplined practice. You drive and drive until driving becomes part of you. You bat and catch and throw until it becomes part of you. And that's how godliness should be. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible says, Exercise yourself toward godliness. That word exercise comes from a Greek verb, gumnazo. We get the English word gymnastics from it. You see, constant practice of godliness leads to a life of godliness. By constant practice, godliness becomes second nature with us. It becomes a habit. And we can unconsciously respond in a godly way. We don't even have to think about it. It's just natural to be godly because we've practiced it. One commercial for Nike shoes goes like this. To be a good baseball player, you catch and throw until your hand is more like leather than the glove. You practice batting until the pitching machine becomes jealous. You practice until your coach asks if he can go home. You do all of this so that someday if you hit a home run, people won't say you were lucky. They'll say you were good. Only practice can make us proficient at something. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it's telling us to practice God in us until it becomes second nature with us. Till we can do it without thinking about it. You can never achieve this level of performance with just half-hearted devotion. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, the Bible says, Solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. There are three basic steps necessary for this permanent change or repentance. Number one, become aware of the sinful practice that has to be changed. That means a couple of things. First, become aware of what constitutes sinful practice. And number two, become aware of when you do these things. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, the Bible says, Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. You see, this is difficult because a sinful practice has become natural or second nature to us sometimes. And we don't realize that we're doing it because it's done unconsciously and automatically. So become aware of the sinful practice that must be put off. Number two, discover the biblical alternative. In Ephesians 5 verse 17, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Your automatic, unconscious, sinful response needs to be replaced with a scriptural alternative. And that brings up point number three, practice the new alternative. 1 Timothy 4 verse 7, exercise yourself toward godliness. Practice the biblical alternative until it becomes second nature to you, until you automatically, unconsciously respond like the Bible says without even having to think about it. This is the only way to repent so that fruits of repentance follow. This is the only way to have a lasting change instead of a change that's temporary like a New Year's resolution. In conclusion, I would encourage you not to give up too easily when trying to change your life. Some people give up just when they're on the brink of success. Many people want instant success. They want change without the daily struggle necessary to accomplish the change. Sometimes they quit when they're just on the brink of succeeding. Do you know that it usually takes about three weeks of daily effort to feel comfortable doing something new? And then it takes another three weeks for that practice to become part of your nature. So repentance is one of the most difficult steps of conversion. But as you can tell, it's very essential. In fact, Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Confession in obeying the gospel is essential and necessary. Jesus said in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Romans chapter 10 verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So just as belief or faith is essential to salvation, so confession is essential to salvation. 1 John 4 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. 
We read of what Paul calls the good confession in 1 Timothy 6, verses 12 and 13. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. 1 Timothy 6.12 then is a reference to what Timothy confessed when he obeyed the gospel. And verse 13 says what Timothy confessed agreed with what Christ confessed before Pilate. Let's look at what Christ confessed before Pilate and the exchanges Jesus had with the Jews in order to have a better understanding of the good confession. If you recall, Pilate ended up concluding that Jesus was the king of the Jews. How did he reach that conclusion? Well, remember the Jews were under the authority of the Roman government. As a conquered nation under Roman law, the Jews no longer had the authority to take anyone's life. So the only way they could kill Christ without getting in trouble with the Roman government was to convince the government that Jesus was an enemy of the state. How did they do that? By declaring that Jesus was a king, thus implying an insurrection, a rebellion against Rome. Luke 23, 1 through 3, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him, Jesus, unto Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Notice very carefully what the Jews said. He himself is Christ, a king. Now Pilate either missed or decided to ignore that they had said anything about him being Christ, which means anointed or Messiah. But he did hear the word king, and that is what he used during the rest of the proceedings, even putting on the sign that Jesus wore to the cross, the king of the Jews, in three different languages. Let's look at the exchanges between Jesus and the Jews to see if what they reported to Pilate was accurate. John chapter 10, various verses through uh, verse 30 through 38, say, I and my father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Verse 36, Jesus said, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified, and sent into the world, thou blasphemest? Because I said, I am the Son of God. So we can see Jesus told the Jews who he was, the Son of God. This was also brought up during Jesus' trial. Matthew 26, 63 and 64 says, But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, or yes, it is as you say. Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Luke 22, verses 66 through 71, reading only verses 67 and 70. Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. Jesus' confession is referred to when he was on the cross. Matthew 27, verses 40 and 43, And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Remember, our point in looking at these verses is to discover what Timothy confessed. Whatever Jesus confessed must be what Timothy confessed. What did Jesus confess to the Jews? That he is Christ and Son of God. Now that is not exactly what the Jews told Pilate, is it? They told him he is Christ, a king. Now why did they put it that way? Because they were trying to explain a religious detail to someone who did not understand spiritual concepts. If you have ever attempted to explain any complex concept to an uninformed person, you know exactly what they were faced with. What they did, though, was refer to all that Jesus had told them. And this is very important, because we can see what Jesus agreed to before Pilate becomes a figure of speech that stands for what Jesus had revealed to the Jews, that he was Christ, 
and Son of God. All that Jesus told the Jews agrees with Peter's confession, which was blessed by Christ. Matthew 16, verses 13, 16, and 17. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And the good confession is also supported by Acts chapter 8, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, where in, ver in verse 35 says, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So the good confession is a statement before men that declares that we believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. And that is essential unto salvation. Greetings in the name of Jesus. In this talk, I will speak to four frequently asked questions about the religious act of baptism. The Bible speaks often on this topic, and those who respect the scriptures as the word of God should be interested in knowing what they have to say on baptism. Please listen and then read the biblical passages to which we refer. The first question is, who should be baptized? The answer is everyone who believes in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The gospel is the good news that Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth to die as a sacrifice for men's sins. In Acts chapter 8, we find an inspired preacher named Philip who was preaching the gospel to a man who is simply called the eunuch. At the time Philip was teaching, they were riding along the road in the eunuch's chariot. As the men listened to the sermon, they came to a body of water. The eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinder me, hinders me to be baptized? The preacher said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. His statement of his belief convinced the preacher and he was baptized. This brings us to our second question, which is, how is baptism carried out? Philip and the eunuch answer this question for us also. The Bible says in verse 38 of Acts chapter 8 that they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. The word baptism in those days always meant a barrel in water or to be immersed in water in obedience to Christ. This fits with what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. He said, We are buried with him, that's with Christ, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The third question is, what is the purpose of baptism? And the answer is to obtain forgiveness of sins and become a child of God. Or to put it in another way, to be made a member of the Lord's church. In Acts chapter 2, Philip preached the first gospel sermon after the resurrection of Jesus. It was on the first Pentecost after Jesus' crucifixion. Some of the same people who killed Jesus were there and heard Peter's sermon. In his sermon, 
Peter reminded them of the prophecies of their Old Testament scriptures which predicted the coming of Jesus. He refreshed them on the miracles that Jesus had done in their presence. And then he ended with a stinging rebuke, saying that this same Jesus, whom you have crucified, has God made both Lord and Christ. Peter's sermon was successful. Those murderers of the Lord were cut to the heart, and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told them, in verse 38, to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When Saul, who had been an unbeliever and a persecutor of Christianity, was converted, he repented and was praying. In Acts chapter 22, we are told that God sent a messenger by the name of Ananias to tell Saul what to do. When Saul found Paul, or when Ananias found Paul and found him repentant and a believer, he said, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. This fits with what the apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Noah's families being saved from the flood in the ark, Peter said was a figure or a picture of how baptism also saves us. The fourth and last question is, is baptism essential to salvation? And the answer is, yes, the scripture says it is. Baptism completes our obedience to God's plan of salvation. The act of baptism alone does not save us. It is not a magic act that one does and then something happens to him. Instead, it is an act of obedience that completes the steps that God has told us to do in order to be saved from our sins. It is an act of obedience to God and of submission of our will to His. It is the act that puts us into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 says, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We read also in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? The phrase, as many of us, means all who. In other words, in Paul's day, all who were baptized were baptized in order to get into Christ. Last of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we are told, For by one Spirit... We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The one body Paul is talking about is the one mentioned just now, the spiritual body of Jesus Christ or his kingdom. All of these things say that baptism is essential to salvation. Please think about these things and may God bless you as you study his word. The church is described in Ephesians 5.27 as a glorious church. Having been conceived in the mind of God as being an integral part of this plan of redemption for fallen man, the church is indeed glorious. The church exists to glorify God, Ephesians 3.21. Every soul that is saved and thus added to the church glorifies God for his grace and mercy. The key word here is added. One can join any denomination, but he cannot join the Lord's church. The Bible tells us that the Lord himself adds people to his church in Acts 2.47. What is the church? Which church does he add men to? What are the requirements, if any, that those living in the first century met before being added to the church? First of all, we note that the church is of divine origin. She is the medium through which God chose to manifest his grace. God's plan to save man through Jesus and his church originated before the world was created, according to Ephesians 1, 3 through 10. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 teaches, It was through the church that God determined to save men of all nations. The Greek word translated church in our English Bibles is ekklesia. 
Ecclesia literally means to call out of and therefore refers to persons who are called out. The word church then technically could refer to any group of people who have been called together for any reason. Obviously, however, the church has come to take on a meaning relative to the Christian community. The church, as we understand it, refers to those individuals who have been called by the gospel of Jesus Christ out of a life of sin and into fellowship with God. The church, then, is not some elaborate, expensive structure where people assemble to worship God, but rather the people themselves who have been called out of the kingdom of the world into the kingdom of God. Those persons who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ make up the church. This agrees with Acts 20, 28, which tells us that the church was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. The church is of Christ in a sense that no other institution is or can be. Jesus promised that he would build it, Matthew 16, 18. He bought and paid for it, according to Acts 20, verse 28. He is the head of it, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It is his. The congregations formed from city to city were churches of Christ, according to Romans 16, 16. The phrase of Christ simply indicates possession or ownership. In fact, there was no other church in existence in the New Testament scriptures than the church of Christ. Matthew 16, 18 states that Jesus would build his church. The church is God's building or house. In 1 Timothy 3, 15, Paul says that the house of God is the church of the living God. Peter explains that the church is a spiritual house in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Therefore, the house of God is not a material building, but rather the souls of those saved by Jesus Christ. Just as your house is the place where you live, God lives in his house, the church. God resides in the church through his Holy Spirit who dwells in the heart of each Christian. God does not live in another house. The church of Christ, as revealed in Scripture, is God's dwelling place, and he lives in no other religious organization. The church is also called the body of Christ. Jesus is the head of his body, which is the church. And Ephesians 4 verse 4 tells us there is one body. The church is also described as the bride of Christ in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. Jesus is the bridegroom, the church is his bride, and therefore she takes on or should wear his name. Every religious body or institution that has been organized has some terms of admission. Some may be as simple as making a statement or proclamation to the effect that one wants to be identified with a certain organization. Some churches, on the other hand, have quite stringent requirements that must be met before allowing admission. Some have even been known to take a vote on whether or not someone might be allowed to join their church. In the first century church, the terms of admission are quite clear. The church was established in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost in AD 33. A careful examination of the passage reveals that after Peter finished preaching the good news about Jesus, he concluded that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The audience then asked the question in verse 37, what shall we do? Peter responded in the next verse, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 states, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Then in verse 47 we read, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The New King James Version translates Acts 2.47 as follows, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now let's notice the relationship between baptism and the church. The Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 12.13 that we are baptized into one body, that one body is the church of Jesus Christ, according to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and Colossians 1, verses 18 and 24. Therefore, we may conclude that when one is baptized into the body, he is also baptized into the church. This truth is also taught in Acts 2, 47, as we've noticed, the Lord added to his church 
the 3,000 individuals who were baptized on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is the life principle of the body of Christ. Anyone who is outside of the body, the church, is lost. This is why Paul wrote in Ephesians 5.23 that Christ is the Savior of the body. Those who have not been baptized into Christ are not saved because the Holy Spirit who is in the body has not made them alive. Paul uses the phrase in Christ over 150 times in his writings. People are either in Christ or out of Christ. One must be in Christ in order to be saved. The phrase in Christ is synonymous with being in the body of Christ, the church. Anyone outside his body remains lost in their sins. People are often heard saying that the church can't save anyone. It is true that no denomination can save anyone. However, even though the Lord does the saving, he does so in his church. No one who is outside of the body of Christ can be saved from their sins. The church of Christ is a glorious divine, blood-bought institution. It is comprised of the saved, in other words, those who have been called by Christ through the gospel. Through their obedience to the gospel plan of salvation, the Lord has added them to his church. In Revelation, the second chapter, the tenth verse, the Bible says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The literal meaning of that is, be faithful at all costs, be faithful even if it kills you. The dedication of the Christian is such that his or her life now belongs to the Lord. There is a total commitment to Christ and to the way of life that he commands. Jesus said also in Matthew 10 and 22, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. So Christianity is not a short-term affair, it is a lifetime affair. Once we give our lives in total surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, we live our lives, all of our lives, in surrender to his authority. How do we do this? Allow the great apostle Peter to tell us in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter gives the formula for security in Christ. He says, if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. What things? The seven Christian graces which he had just enumerated. Look at what he says by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. It is not done haphazardly, but diligently. We are to add to our faith. Faith is the foundation of all Christian growth, and we are to keep building on that foundation. Peter gives us a number of things that we must build on that foundation. First, he says, add to your faith virtue. The simple definition of virtue is courage. A man of faith is a man of courage. Because we believe in God, we courageously face life with all of its challenges and difficulties. We're like Abraham, of whom the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11 and 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. That's courage. God said go and he went, expecting the outcome to be for the very best. And it was. If we add virtue to our faith, we will have the courage to profess our faith even in the face of a hostile world. We will have the courage to live our faith regardless of the varying circumstances of life. Next, Peter says that we must add knowledge. This is such an important step toward our spiritual maturity. Knowledge is power, we are told. Jesus said in John 7 and 17, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. The American Standard Version says, if any man willeth to do his will, he will know. If you really desire to do the will of God, you will learn what that will is. 
Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It is so important to know the truth, and that truth is found in God's word. Jesus in his prayer to the Father said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. So the Christian must daily study the word and grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. The next step in our quest for eternal life is temperance. Temperance is simply self-control. The Christian must constantly work on the mastery of self. Our greatest enemy to the righteous life is self. This is why Jesus said in Luke 9 and 23, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The goal of the Christian is not to please self, but the master. We must control our tongue, our passions, our desires, ourselves. On our way to eternal life, Peter says that we must also add patience. Patience speaks of endurance, perseverance, holding out, steadfastness, constancy in service. Someone has said that patience is the ability to keep your motor idling when you feel like stripping the gears. An old preacher once described patience by saying that we first take hold, second hold on, third never let go. The Hebrew writer advises us to run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As we strive for excellence in Christian living, Peter says that we must add godliness. We usually think of godliness as godlikeness, but probably the word is better defined as godwardness. Paul admonishes, exercise thyself unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4 and 7. Another translation says, train yourself to be godly. This should be the dominant desire of our life, to have a Godward attitude that always looks toward the things that please God. Then we must add brotherly kindness. This expression just literally means love of brothers. It speaks of the family type love that we have in the body of Christ or in the church. It is a love that recognizes the commonality that we have with those who are pursuing the same course from grace to glory, from earth to heaven. We are children of the same Father. We are citizens of the same kingdom. We have the same goals and purposes in life. Paul admonishes us to be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. Romans 12 and 10. We have a special care for those in the family of God. Finally, Peter urges that we add charity or love. That is that special love that originates with God. It is a love that loves the unlovable. It is the unique love of a Christian which emulates the love of God who loved us and gave his only begotten son to die for us. John 3 and 16. And it's the love of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Ephesians 5 and 25. While faith is the foundation of the Christian life, love is the motivator of the Christian life. Paul said that he was constrained by love to do all that he did in the service of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 14. Jesus said in John 13 and 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Love is the crowning grace in the list of Christian graces. We are never more like God than when we love, for God is love. 1 John 4 and 8. Now Peter says, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Eternal security belongs to those who do these things. So, my friend, become a Christian through obedience to the gospel, and then be thou faithful unto death. This concludes our series on the plan of salvation. You've now been given the Bible answer to the Bible question, What must I do to be saved? Friend, let me remind you that God sent His only begotten Son to make it possible for you to be saved. God loves you and doesn't want you to be lost. When the fullness of time was come, God sent His own Son to be a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected on the third day. God's Word reveals His plan whereby we can take advantage of the saving blood of His Son. 
God's plan first requires man to hear the gospel, Romans 10:17. Then man must believe in Jesus as the Son of God, John 8, 24. He must then repent of his sins, Acts 17 and verse 30. Confess with his mouth Jesus as God's Son, Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. And be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, 38. If you demonstrate your love and faith by obeying the commands of the Lord, he will then add you to his church where he wants you to abide faithfully, unto death. Acts 2, 47, Revelation 2, verse 10. Why not obey this simple yet wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus died for you, and He wants you to be saved. If you have any questions or comments, or if you would like assistance in obeying the gospel, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us using the information listed on the back cover of the carrying case for this CD. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you in your efforts to know and understand the truth of His Word. I've watched and been made clean.